Toriyama's sole intention was to end Dragon Ball right after the pillow arc, because he had initially planned it as a Journey of the West clone, not only for its Chinese culture callbacks, but also for its length. Such a decision is clearly divisive because on one hand, he had any right to seize a story that received lukewarm feedback back in mid-80s, but then again, 23 chapters of an enjoyable yet tame adventure with very limited action is yet to be considered a complete and captivating product. Some fans still wonder why he would continue an all-around mid-manga, and the most plausible answer would be ambition. And what does ambition bring at the most? Cash. Yes, let's not skate around it, that must have been the only motive that convinced Toriyama to continue in the first place. Fortunately for him, in chapter 15, Kamen Senin offered Goku the possibility to become his disciple, which could be the ultimate insight Goku and Dragon Ball itself needed to compel at long last, a character-driven story replacing a more eventful arc that would culminate with Goku testing the result of his training in a world tournament, all in 31 chapters, 8 more than the Son Goku arc, resulting in a slightly longer, yet way more interesting arc. This, folks, is the 21st Tenkaichi Budokai. May 14, 1985, the date of chapter 24, and May 28, 1986, the first broadcast on Fuji TV Wednesday evenings, the day after the release of the chapter of General Blue confronting Kuriri and Bulma in the Red Ribbon arc. And here we are again to uncover the various differences between the manga and the TV transposition. My advice would be to support my channel as I'd like to reach 10,000 subs before 2026, as well as to support me on Patreon. Now with the banging on out of the way, let's continue our journey. In chapter 24, Goku reaches Kame House and Muten Roshi agrees about training him on the sole condition that he brings him a Pichi Pichi Gal, or more simply, a young lady's a sexual tool. A funny chapter overall, considering Goku can hardly tell apart boys from girls without patting their crotches, and is totally unable to judge their cosmetology. The anime recreates this whole chapter, also adding Goku's skin tone journey, reusing some background animation from episode 4 and the drinking deer from the debut in the meantime, and actually gives more screen time to the remainder of the Dragon Gang, with Yancha's airplane busting, forcing them to go through a vast desert by foot. While I wouldn't call this pillar essential, I like how they crossed Kurigin's introduction beforehand, as the gang escapes upon hearing his voice from a distance. In fact, the Eastern Orient Temple dweeb receives a couple of extra scenes before his canon debut in the manga, in which he's shown running across the forest and the desert, with the only purpose of being accepted by Muten Roshi as his pupil. They may be small, yet they tell me a lot more about Kurin's determination, other than his canon debut in chapter 25, in which Goku brings another peachy peachy gal, who turns out to be a mermaid, and Kurin bribes Muten Roshi with dirty magazines in order to be accepted as his pupil. Huh, he's got also a gay magazine in the anime, much to his horror. And since I had to address this matter earlier in the video, I'd better do it now to be thorough. Coloration Personally, Goku's outfit during his training is very underrated, because the white undershirt is the ultimate item of clothing for men. Trends may change, but nothing will ever remove the white undershirt from its place. It's easily the most versatile item of clothing, regardless of seasons, climate and temperature, and this is likely the best caption ever, as it fits such an occasion as well. Goku's pants, though, looks analogous to those from his former outfit for sight, but the reality is they're not the same pair of pants, because the belt is slightly smaller and in the manga they're not light orange, but share a more similar hue with the anime coloration, while in the TV version they're blue colored like the previous pair, but the belt is light blue instead of white. Nonetheless, if such a discrepancy is minimal to a degree, Kurin's outfit is better colored in the anime, and we're going to see why later in the video, because I do believe the manga has been overusing orange hues on fabric too much. Dark yellow looks more fitting in this case. And please let me cite the mermaid's hair one more time. Blue in the manga, but purple in the TV series. Does this remind you of anything? Thought so. 
Back to the plot, given that Umigami is his literal voice of reason that scolds him whenever he has sinful plans in mind, I can see why Muten Roshi would take advantage of his absence to non-stop objectification since the turtle is away on vacation. But considering his training lasts 8 months and Umigami never comes back, I simply wonder how long does his vacation last? Could it be an inside joke of him being a turtle so the slower he is, the slower his vacation turns out? Mm, kinda makes sense. Speaking of which, Kuririn cannot ride on Kintone due to his impure thoughts and Mutenroshi rebukes him for his will to become stronger to impress girls. Though I don't really think he's really in the position of being prudish. I mean, didn't he ask a 16 year old girl to show him her undergarments? Age of consent for sure, but still a minor. Anyway, chapter 26 introduces Lunch, a peculiar girl that alters her attitude whenever she sneezes. Her blonde self is an aggressive and violent fugitive, while her blue haired side is very gentle and clueless. And isn't that ironic Mami Koyama, the historic voice actress of Arale in Dr. Slump, voices her in the anime? You may suppose she sounds perfect. <sighs> it's unfortunate the side of Lunch manages to be even more clueless than Arale. The sneeze twist occurs during the chase segment in the manga, but the TV version decides to anticipate it during an anime exclusive saloon segment, not likely the most imaginative setting out there, but works just fine in order to showcase how Lan's two sides differ. I might say by taking the opposite route from the manga, as her blunt self is introduced first in the original, whereas her gentler self debuts first here. Besides, she's even shown stealing from a train after bombing it to make events more accurate. Yet it doesn't suffice because I'm actually going to keep my thoughts on Lunt's character for later, you'll see why. Fast forward to chapter 28, which the TV series didn't shake up much apart from Goku's extended exploration of the new island on his skin tone, which reuses animation from the third episode, though in a quite clever way. But at long last, Muten Roshi's training is about to begin. To Goku's excitement, which is enough for me to activate the Waku Waku counter. The first W bomb to be dropped in this arc. And another note, I'll try my best not to include any of his depraved moments, because there's a whole profusion of them in the anime, and if you ever made a drinking game out of it, you would get a drunker stupor quickly. Once again, I cannot promise you anything, but I'll try regardless. So, after a speed test, Goku and Kuririn have to search for the turtle mark rock thrown by Muten Roshi, and the one who brings it first wins, while the loser gets no dinner. Despite his nose handicap his inferior strength, Kuririn manages to win through some cheap shots, taking massive advantage of Goku's naivety, so he gets to have dinner with Kamesenin and lunch, only to be agonized by their pufferfish meal, which leaves them confined in bed for a few days. Karma. Yet I don't really enjoy how Toriyama treats it as a mere exposition square because such a satisfying twist must be shown, which is precisely what the anime does. It's clearly a massive improvement over the manga, though apparently Lunch is stupid enough to ignore blowfish are poisonous. In chapter 30, Muten Roshi's training officially begins, consisting of delivering milk across the island in the early morning, which isn't even a quarter of his training routine, as plenty of unlikely exercises are awaiting Goku and Kuriri in the following chapters. Besides, the main event of this arc is being announced by a monk, voiced by the very narrator and TV series, a martial arts tournament that is to begin in 8 months, in which lots of martial artists gather from all around the world to find out who's the strongest. And the two's intention is to partake in its 21st edition. But before they do, let's take the beginning of the chapter for a moment. First off, notice how both renditions don't expose Muten Roshi's eyeballs. The anime even has him wear a sleep mask with his sunglasses still on, likely in order to avoid ID spoilers for later. That's somewhat clever. The anime also solves a doubt raised by the manga, as someone might wonder why Lunch's violet side would be prone to sleeping with Goku, so they simply added a filler bit with her gentler self, which also reminds us Goku has a slush prone mindset. Chapters 30 and 31 do a fairly solid job at developing Muten Roshi's training method by having Goku and Kuririn do everything but what they thought they would have learned, which is what makes this section great. 
with Roshi proves is not just a lecherous hermit, but also a wise mentor that isn't really interested in turning his pupils into powerhouses, but more like into well-trained and well-educated yet humble martial artists that have to fight only if it's necessary and not for attention-seeking motives. All these tasks like milk delivery, field blowing, assisting construction workers and studying function as the ultimate ground floor for Goku and creating his growth as both characters and warriors so that they will be way more prepared for the Tenkaichi Budokai without being too full of themselves. It's besides a unique training section that deprives Muten Roshi from nearly any of the mentor tropes such as I have no longer anything to teach you or wax on wax off, arguably the highlight of this arc. With that said, Toriyama stuck to his portion alone to Goku and Kuririn's education, but never bothered to let us know what and how other characters were doing in the meantime, which is conversely further analyzed in episodes 17 and 18, as the TV series displays several nameless fighters we'll never see again, preparing for the tournament and most of all, Yamcha testing his skills in a dojo in West City. Fairly decent filler, lowered by the amount of reused animation from episode 5 and 13. What also kinda bugged me about this is Puar's overreaction upon praising Yamcha's strength. Takao Koyama and his out of character moments striking again. I wonder when this habit will officially get out of hand. But who am I kidding? There is already something that got out of hand quickly. Lunch's knees gag, which happens far more frequently in the anime and wouldn't you know, it got old very fast. Because I had to be 100% honest, Lunch hasn't got a purpose other than sneezing and being a sexual token, for now. Yes, that's the irony of a character owning two personalities that still make her lack a proper identity. It is true Toriyama would literally forget her existence within a few years, but the anime does nothing but fuel these recurring cliches which make her become a narrative wallflower. Though I guess Goku's niece Karin Muten Roshi and Kuririn is a quite funny subversion, but Lance fake out sneeze on the other hand didn't it already happen back in chapter 26? Yet the exact same episode includes an actually relevant tile of Korean's backstory, which explains the motive that brought him to become stronger. Individual payback against those Orin Temple bullies who were constantly looking down on him. If you do consider this pillar flashback, it will inevitably make his payback way more satisfying. So neat job. Eight months later, the turtle training wraps up in chapter 32, and Goku and Kuririn are finally ready for the real deal, the Tenkaichi Budokai. But before they do, Toshiki Noe gives another training section to Yamcha in episode 19, in which he smashes a rock with his Rogafufuken. I personally like the fact it's set at night, it doesn't happen too often. It's also well boarded by Takenochi and handled competently by Katsuyoshi Nakatsuru, who's been constantly growing at Seigasha. Though for being someone who has retreated to a mountain for a straight month, his facial hair doesn't look too untamed. You're actually supposed to look hairier than this. Then we get to the next filler, in which Yamcha decides to return to West City just in time to save Bulma from being run over by a truck. How does she react? Instead of thanking him, she scolds him for his craftiness and for disappearing for a month without telling her anything. Seems fair up to now. Then she tells him to get himself a haircut, because long hair is unfashionable nowadays. Yes, what about Bajit? Would be an obvious retaliation against her hypocrisy, but it's too untimely. I would instead place our attention to Bulma Yamcha's highly unstable relationship in this pillar, which is conversely kinda alright during the tournament because A. Toriyama doesn't rightfully care for romance, and B. it sort of foreshadows an issue I will be covering in the following arc. Back to the Tenkaichi Budokai entrance, this is likely the very first time the manga and the anime don't follow the same path, as Goku and Kuririn take on the preliminary matches in chapters 33 and 34, also officially wearing their Turtle School uniforms will be dissecting later. They soon realize their unlikely training actually paid off, as they defeat their opponents rather easily, and at long last Kuririn can get his payback against one of his Ori Temple bullies by sending him flying over the wall. Huh. And Yamcha defeats another one of them in the anime too. Good for him. Speaking of which, Goku reunites with him in chapter 34 during the preliminaries, as well as with the rest of the Dragon Gang in chapter 35 nearly after the end of the preliminaries. 
On the other hand, the TV adaptation does the total opposite. The reunion recurs at night, which is a cool change of pace we don't see very often in the series, specifically the night before the preliminaries. Overall, I'm inclined to prefer this latter rendition, it looks more cohesive and less scattered. And as the animated tradition demands, side characters are way more active here than in Toriyama's work, which isn't always recommendable as we'll see in the future, but in this case Bulma was oolong to pick her up near the window so that she can peek inside better. She could have thought of having Oolong turn into a ladder sooner, which is not necessary anymore because the whole cause by your in temple jackass can provide a more comfy vision. Filler taking advantage of a canon situation to create a fluid continuity, I like that. I do also like Oolong covering Bulma's upskirt earlier, thus forbidding tall strangers to stare at it. Yes, even a pervert reaches its limits once in a while. Back to chapter 33, Goku and Kirin put on the Turtle School Dogi for the very first time, one of the most popular uniforms of the entire franchise, with that kanji even on Dragon Ball fans are reminiscent of, standing for Kame, Turtle. As for its colors in the manga, we get more light orange, blue wristbands and belt, white patch and black shoes, which would actually be alright if the orange wasn't this overused chapters prior. Just observe this panel of the same chapter, in which Kuririn confronts his former bully. Now can you see why I stated the yellow hue from the anime was better? Or Goku's initial outfit, only without the Kami symbol and socks, it's like there wasn't much difference without the Kami symbol. These uniforms look exactly interchangeable due to the non-existent variety. I would understand if they used a darker tone of orange, but there's none of it. They've been using the same light orange pigmentation since chapter 1. Moreover, it seems like Toei was aware of this boring overuse, as this specific manga coloration would neither be followed in Dragon Ball nor in Dragon Ball Z, but only eons later in Dragon Ball Super Brawl in 2018, just because they wanted to recreate Oriyama's color palette to the latter. Accordingly, the TV version ignores the bland coloration of the Turtle Dogi by opting for brighter and more vibrant hues. With the exception of the blue wristbands, the fabric is red, the Kame patch is yellow, shoes are blue and the belt is black. So, more variety and more evident distinction from other uniforms. And as I stated in the previous video, I like variety so I appreciate this coloration better. Although I do wonder why they would change it in Dragon Ball Z, but I digress. Moving on, chapter 35 draws the four matchups of the 21st Tenkaichi Budokai. Kurin against Bacterian, Yamcha against Jackie Chun, Lan Fan against Namu and Goku against Giran. It's hosted by this nameless guy, whose backstory is unknown, whose personal life is unspecified, whose personality uncertain, but I just like him. He's a great character regardless, he's like the reincarnation of an average Dragon Ball fan who witnesses and commentates the primary fight. He's even voiced by Kenji Utsumi, who was Senbei Norimaki in Dr. Slump across original Dragon Ball, since he would be replaced by Ryotaka Suzuoki Tenshi Han's voice actor in Dragon Ball Z. Chapter 36 showcases Kuririn face Bacterian's nauseating techniques, with little to no differences in the TV series. Though one thing that always bugged me about this fight is everybody else's doubt. How in bloody Sailor Mars can Kuririn be affected by Bacterian's stench if he lacks a nose? I get the whole the stench is in your mind stuff and all, which is precisely what Goku claims too, but uh, if he never had the possibility to smell beforehand, how can he possibly imagine a sensory field he was never familiar with? Perhaps I'm just overthinking too much, it's only a minor fight ending with a point black rear gas, kind of ironic. Then Yamcha has to fight against the mysterious Jackie Chun in chapter 37, ending up overwhelmed by such a more skilled warrior. Woe is him, luck isn't definitely on Yamcha's side, but at least he got to shine for a while in the anime. Speaking of which, the battle is surprised extremely close to Toriyama's source by Maeda's Prenakaide unit in episode 22. And in addition, Koyama previously illustrates an eating contest between Goku and Giran, which does nothing but exhibit the two supposite attitudes. Giran keeps a rather selfish and hostile behavior, whereas Goku doesn't hesitate one bit to share his meal with Namu, despite never conversing with him. After all, it's the same attitude that brought him to help Umigami in the first arc. He's being selfless as usual and this filler confirms his good nature. 
Strange, me praising Kuyama of all people. <laughs> Better not get used to it. In episode 22, the I'll Give You Romance outro received some animation updates, like Kurin Muten Rose's first appearance and blue haired Lance holding a machine gun right amongst the birdies illustrations. This second version would be used up until the end of the 22nd Kaichi Budokai. Coming next in chapter 38, Namu is dealing with Lan Fan's destructive technique. More powerful than the Genki Dama, more dangerous than the Kikoho. Stripping. It's indeed quite effective on most of the bystanders minus Goku, who wonders why Namu is running away from Lan Fan in the anime, which Kurini replies, something a child wouldn't understand. Pretty amusing considering he's only one year older than Goku. In actuality, our main attraction isn't supposed to be Lan Fan's lingerie armor, or Yamcha suspecting Jackie Chun might be coming and in disguise. But the fact Muten Roshi came for some unspecified reason read other people's minds. Since when is he some sort of psychologist? I get it, it has to describe Namu's backstory so that their conversation will make more sense within a few chapters, but... Uh, but it still won't stop Jackie Chun simping over Lan Fan. The match between Goku and Giran takes place in chapter 39, but the anime decides to call it off momentarily due to a thunderstorm, leading up to a bar segment in which the Ori Temple bullies are back on track to tease Giran, wearing a raincoat and a fedora, who trashes them to see them never again. Given how fast he turns out, Yamcha begs him to stop to no avail, as even challenges Goku inside the bar, but the two are immediately stopped by Jackie Chun, as fighting outside the ring is forbidden, which is actually an anime-only rule, and they have to wait for the rain to end in order to settle their score. Essentially, the whole first half of episode 23 is filler content, and a solid one indeed. Nishio's direction is pretty good, I like how they establish Giran threat by portraying him as overbearing and unlikable as possible, perhaps a bit too unlikable, so that Goku's win will sound more prophetic because his goal was to make Giran surrender on his own, and it indeed happens upon his tail grows back fortuitously. Skip to chapter 41, the announcer interviews Goku and Kuririn, so Jackie Chun steps in to grab his mic and perform. <sighs> I wish I had come up with a corny counter, because I never got the joke behind this scene. He asks the announcer if he's up to interview him, then snatches his mic and does this. I, I mean it, where is the joke? It's basically one of those it happens moments, so corny and random, and Goku of course joins in, because why not? Anyway, since there is nothing much to comment about the fight between Kurin and Jackie Chun, apart from the former shooting boogers in spite of lacking a nose, let's take a moment to dissect the evolution of Kurin's eyeballs. During his early chapters, Toriyama tended to draw his eyes like reversed straight angles, but once they're open, they do display white scleras, which are also reprised in the anime initially, as well as in most of the future Dragon Ball games, up until the second Budokai Tenkaichi installment, because the third installment implements the flesh-colored scleras he will maintain from episode 25 onwards. I've honestly never figured out why he's the only main character without the white of the eye at some point. The TV series taking too many liberties again. Anyway, the two semi-finals aren't outstanding, but are very well choreographed and do showcase plenty of interesting bits, like Kurini's panties trick, Jackie Chun's jet-propelled Kamehameha and Sansoken, Goku mimicking this leather technique, and the Tasmanian Devil, and the Namu's Strike of the Heavens. The 21st Tenkaichi Budokai doesn't stand out battle-wise, but definitely avails of a heterogeneous set of moves. Chapter 46, Namu bids farewell to the readers, only in the manga, and Goku and Jackie Chun are ready to start the final battle, bringing another Waku Waku to account, not before another interview in the anime, with Goku replying awkwardly and Jackie falling asleep. The final battle begins in chapter 47, with plenty of great stuff like the Tailcopter and the Kamehameha Clash. Episode 26, arguably the best one of this arc, adds Jackie Chun performs some corny moves before his Kamehameha so that he won't arouse suspicion further. Which is quite humorous, just like him showing his family tree later, since Goku believes he might be one of Muten Roshi's relatives. Well, uh, didn't he already try to fool Yams and the others by having Namu disguised as Kamisenin? Aren't you forgetting something? Bah. 
In Chapter 48, the big showdown is resembling a full-fledged duel more and more, as Jackie uses a double Sanzo Ken, but Goku retaliates with a triple Sanzo Ken. Jackie pretends to be intoxicated to attack his opponent with his Sui Ken, good idea considering Goku can't mimic it due to never drinking before, but still doesn't impede him from unleashing his feral instincts by acting like a mad dog with his Kyo Ken, and then like a monkey with his Saru Ken in the following chapter. As for for the TV version, while it normally includes extra scenes, in this instance it actually erases the Kyoken, skipping directly to Goku's Saruken. I'm not sure why, it perhaps has something to do with the kick panel which occurred before the Saruken in the original, whereas it comes in succession here. Also another Waku Waku. Chapters 49 and 50 supply another back and forth of Jackie Chun's hypnosis technique, only meeting Goku's hunger as a major obstacle, who retaliates with an infective Janken fist. But it seems Jackie has yet got to uncover his trump card, his most dangerous technique that not even Son Gohan could withstand, the Bankoku Bikuri Show, an electric discharge fired from his palms, which seems like the right move as Goku is actually about to give in when... Uh, he stares at the full moon and turns again into an Ozaru, much to everyone's consternation. First off, it's likely the only time a main battle in the series isn't fully set on daytime, and it was quite surprising to find out the sun was setting in both renditions. As for the full moon itself, while it's not supposed to look this crisp before nighttime, it's not really a totally unrealistic phenomenon either. As far as I'm concerned, I watch it even at noon once in a while, therefore its visibility is possible to an extent. However, my true complaint was stand on Goku never stepping outside the ring as an Ozaru while he's smashing the Budokai building. That comes off as a tad less likely. In any case, Yamcha prepares to carry out the same scheme as last time, but Jackie Chun fires a maximized Kamehameha at the full moon to stop the Ozaru's fury. Nothing not worthy here, apart from Toru Furuya spelling out the word Yamero as if he were to charge a Kamehameha, so Yamero. It's one of those unintentionally funny bits everybody seems to be neglecting. Although, what's with the gang of sober reaction next? They should know killing the opponent is forbidden in this very competition. At any rate, the battle is reaching its final stage in chapter 52, as Jackie Chun risks a ring out but manages to snap out of it because he didn't properly fall to the ground. The two met their limits, and according to the anime version only, they've been fighting for four straight hours. Nevertheless, Jack is willing to win at all costs to teach a valuable lesson to his pupil, and this is where his fighting experience comes to play, as no matter their fatigue, he can still use his longer legs to implement more power to his final kick, to the detriment of Goku's tinier body which is correctly what happens in Chapter 53, yet the TV series extends this final clash by exhibiting Daisuke Nishio's innate vocation for choreographies, yet ruined by constantly produced animation. Though, what in actuality makes this scene notable is that insert song, Meza Seten Kaichi, performed by Hiroaki Takahashi, the singer of Makafushigi Adventure. They only play the intro, the second verse and chorus, because the first section cites the 22nd Tenkaichi Budokai, but what else can I say? This is one of the best insert songs of the whole franchise, period. Unsure whether it's the very best, but given that Ultimate Battle is overused and Battle Point Unlimited is a pleasure I am um, an original, I guess it comes very close. It's never misplaced in the anime, it is great and improves an otherwise unimpressive segment. In spite of Goku's excellent performance, Jackie Chun wins the competition and earns the 500,000 Zenis prize money. The anime lets us pick on how Muten Roshi intends to spend it, not astonishing, but in actuality won't be able to satiate his lewd thoughts because his role as master and or hindrance for Goku's formation drained his power and most of all his prize money. Perhaps I should have invented a Goku eating counter too. Though in his defense, he did eat in moderation this time. Amazing punchline. I'm actually stopping here, as I'd better take on the end of this chapter next time, because it quickly connects with the Red Ribbon Arc events. So let's see how the various animation studios evolved during these 15 episodes. For starters, unlike in the Pillar Arc, each supervisor finally gets to shine without the urge of to follow Maeda's sheets, with a few peculiar animators showing off some more talent in each studio, therefore I'll try to sound a bit more specific than last time. 
Episode 14 introduces a new supervisor, freelancer Katsumi Aoshima, whom we saw back in episode 8, who tends to solo animate his entries. He takes on 3 out of 15 episodes, he's always been a fan favorite for his I can't believe it's not Maeda artwork, but his conservativeness sort of lowers his output. It is reasonable for sure, but recycling clips can be deceiving sometimes. His other scene though will be mentioned another day, it's still tolerable for now. Studio Junior supervises only two episodes in this arc, as opposed to the three of the Pilaf arc, I know it should be counting episode 8, but that was more like a last house work. And in spite of Maeda's sporadic key animation, their performance is passable, but still far from great. Conversely, Seigasha takes the cake of the studio with the highest potential in this arc. Only two episodes, but quality placed before quantity, starring Katsuyoshi Nakatsu's bubbly animation, Takeo Ida's pierced grimaces, Yoko Izuka's stiffness, the explosivity of a promising Masahiro Shimanuki, and Tomikichi Takeuchi. His studio sure has plenty of talent in this showcase. As for Last House, his involvement increased quite a bit, with 4 episodes out of 15, sadly underlining their growing role of toy sacrificial lambs. Yet Masayuki Uchiyama's run supervision remains suitable during this era, and even his studio can boast some rough diamonds, like zealous Taichiro Oara and a 20-year-old young man with quite some potential. Studio Live and Shinto Pro got a couple of episodes each, with Yuki Obizawa's triangular shapes dominating the former, albeit interchanging with more pleasant artwork by Mari Tominaga and Satoru Kuzuda, and Mitsuo Shinto's corrections overwhelming in the latter, as his adult characters have the tendency to look like delinquents, and much like Studio Live, his episodes are pretty unimpressive animation-wise. Oof, and there you have it, the entirety of the 21st Tenkaichi Budokai dissected in both versions. Overall, it improves anything from the previous arc. Characters, action, storytelling and Goku's personality, which finally gets to develop properly thanks to Muten Roshi's lessons. The latter indeed plays the double role of master and final boss, against of which Goku has to fight to prove he's become stronger within a scarce year. All the training segment is great, perhaps my favorite part of this arc, as the two train by doing what I never thought they would do, which makes it so, so unique. The Budokai portion is pretty solid too, not every fight manages to be satisfying, but again, the vast variety of techniques each contestant showcases definitely makes it a bit more creative. I also like how the anime donates a few shiny moments to Yamcha prior to his defeat, unlike in Toriyama's version, as well as underlining Kirin's backstory so that his payback would be well earned, and as a whole these pillars seem like a more or less welcome addition to the canon story. Yet I predict some pains will grow in the very next arc and I won't be as lenient.